Hello, everybody. Um, thank you and uh, for coming to this uh, presentation, this webcast, and um, hope that uh, it will provide some insight into an area of study that I've been working on for quite a while now. Just by way of introduction, um, my name is Julian Lum. I am a scientist at the BC Cancer Agency uh, in Victoria, BC. Um, we're just north of Seattle on the other side of the strait um, and part of a larger organization uh, with the Cancer Agency located in Vancouver. Um, so uh, I wanted to um, talk about uh, an area which combines two very intense areas of research uh, right now. Uh, one, um, metabolism of tumors, and secondly, uh, immunotherapy. And um, the talk will hopefully provide an intersection between those two areas. Um, so the other thing, just administratively before I forget, is that um, this is a CMA, CME uh, accredited talk. There are some questions at the end which you're encouraged to answer to um, get your credits. Um, Okay, so first off, I, I just like to thank uh, and acknowledge the people who are involved in this work. Um, uh, former graduate student, uh, research associate, and other members, past and present. Um, my colleagues, uh, Brad Nelson, uh, who's uh, the director here at the uh, Daily Research Center, uh, Peter Watson, who um, uh, is an expert in uh, immunohistochemistry, um, and then a whole team at OVCARE. Uh, this is a research group located in Vancouver um, that has a very uh, specific focus on understanding uh, ovarian cancer and a large list of uh, people who are involved in the work. Um, I don't have any declarations of uh, any conflicts of interest and uh, thank the funding agencies for uh, supporting this work. This is just a picture of my group here. Uh, we're very fortunate to be on the West Coast and take advantage of all the outdoor activities. Okay, so um, we now know that um, the immune system plays a very important role in uh, cancer and uh, ovarian cancer is no exception. Um, this is a, a slide that um, depicts two patients. Uh, one on the left, patient one, um, has been stained. Well, both sections from these patients have been stained with uh, an antibody that recognizes CD8 positive uh, lymphocytes, uh, or sorry, CD3 positive lymphocytes in this particular case. Um, and as you can tell, patient one, you can see there's uh, quite a substantial amount of tumor infiltration of CD3 positive cells within the tumor, whereas in patient two, um, there are very few of these. So um, when you look at a whole cohort of patients, now um, we've looked at uh, over 500 cases of high-grade serous ovarian carcinoma. Um, this is the most prevalent uh, form of histotype of ovarian cancer. Greater than 90% of patients uh, present with this type. Um, and so if you do an analysis of the survival over time, just asking the question, uh, how does the presence or absence of CD3 positive lymphocytes associate with survival, you can clearly see that uh, here in the solid line, CD3 positive, uh, patients with high levels of CD3 positive cells uh, have much better overall outcomes than patients here on the dotted line with uh, um, fewer or no um, CD3 positive T cells. Okay, so this really set up um, the question for us because um, when we started to look more in depth at um, tissue sections from these patients, um, 
this is a, 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 a one of the typical things that that we might find. So, uh, what you see here is actually uh, a, s a single tissue section that has been stained by immunohistochemistry um, uh, with different markers. Um, the images are then overlaid, and you get uh, you can create a pseudo color image. So while it looks um, very much like an immunofluorescent stain, it's actually uh, an immunohistochemistry stain performed on uh, archival material. So in red, what we have is a pan uh, cytokeratin antibody that uh, lights up in red the tumor cells. And then in green, pink, uh, we have different immune subsets. So for the purposes of this slide, it's not um, critical to understand what those subsets are. Uh, what the important take-home message here is that what we often find is that um, the tumors, while there are um, lymphocytes present in them, um, we find that there's actually a disconnect. There's, a, there's a, essentially a barrier between which the immune cells and the tumor cells are, are demarcated. So these immune cells that are light, lit up in either green uh, or pink, uh, you see that there's a problem. The cells are actually, the immune cells, which are important in actually recognizing and destroying these tumors, are physically in isolation. So there have been uh, intense research efforts, of course, to understand um, how not only can we enhance the function of these immune cells, but drive them into uh, the tumor for, so that they can actively engage the tumors. So my laboratory has taken a slightly different approach on this problem. And um, we have been interested in uh, understanding what are the barriers that prevent these immune cells from actually engaging the tumor cells, rather than uh, trying to determine immunological therapies that enhance, simply enhance the function of those T cells. And I think this is a very important question because um, as cancer immunotherapies become much more uh, readily available and widespread clinically, um, we need to understand uh, what the immune cells encounter and how do they deal with the tumor, tumor microenvironment. So we've taken um, the approach of thinking about how does this metabolic environment dictate um, the immune uh, invasion, if you will, of the tumor cell, into the tumor cell. Um, so we have been quite interested in a, a, a cellular stress pathway, um, hypoxia in particular, and this is a, a scenario where cells are exposed to low oxygen. Um, in the context of a tumor cell, we know from uh, a large number of studies that as tumor cells begin to grow and divide, here shown in the black, uh, black bar, okay, um, the nutrient availability uh, begins to become exhausted. So the metabolic stress levels increase as denoted in this red bar at the bottom. Okay, so metabolic stress. And uh, eventually what happens is that these tumors begin to outstrip the vasculature uh, and the, their demands, uh, metabolic demands, then uh, necessitate uh, a secondary response, which is the formation of new blood vessels, or uh, otherwise known as angiogenesis. Okay? And, um, and then uh, the nutrient levels and other factors are then restored to allow this tumor cell to continue uh, growing and dividing. And so I, I will also like to just point out in this slide a couple of markers um, that, that we will use. Um, CD31 or CD34 is end of endothelial markers of the vasculature, um, um, which while they um, can demarcate these vessels, uh, one important consideration is that um, these markers don't necessarily tell you 
um, the functionality of those markers. So that's very important to keep in mind. Okay. So what is hypoxia and, and what does it do and, and why are we interested in this in the metabolic environment? Um, hypoxia is a, a cellular adaptive response to low oxygen and in, in, a, in a normal situation where oxygen is present, a transcription factor called HIF1-alpha is uh, constitutively uh, transcribed and expressed and through the action of uh, an enzymatic reaction with these prolohydroxylases. Um, what happens is, is that HIF1-alpha becomes hydroxylated and is recognized uh, by a, a, a an E3 ligase VHL to cause it to be marked for ubiquitin in degradation. Okay, so while this uh, protein is constitutively transcribed and translated, it's also constitutively constitutively degraded under low oxygen. When cells become exposed to low oxygen or hypoxia, okay, so this is uh, this here, okay, uh, uh, this degradation pathway um, is inhibited and what ends up happening is that uh, HIF1-alpha begins to accumulate, translocate into the nucleus and bind to uh, what are known as HIF response elements uh, within target genes. And the targets of HIF1 are, are, uh, are there are many of them, uh, ones that are genes that are involved in angiogenesis, apoptosis, cell proliferation and survival, autophagy, uh, glucose metabolism, pH regulation, and other proteolytic, proteolytic pathways. And so I've just highlighted a couple of target genes, in particular VEGF, that are part of the angiogenesis pathway, which will be important for um, uh, some upcoming slides, and also um, cell survival pathways, autophagy, uh, which is also going to um, become important in, in a few, few, few more slides, as well as um, CA9, which is uh, also known as carbonic anhydrase 9. And this gene or protein acts to uh, help regulate um, pH levels. Okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> so one of the first um, uh, in, forays into investigating, uh, you know, the metabolic aspects of ovarian cancer um, is was for us to ask whether or not to, these tumors actually. Um, display features of hypoxia or metabolic stress. And uh, so here are two example slides of uh, a TMA where we stained uh, sections with C9 and uh, LC3, uh, and antibody against LC3, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. So as you can tell, we see very nice C9 staining on the membrane of uh, the tumor cells. Um, indicating that uh, a hypoxic event um, had occurred. Um, in addition to that, we were able to observe some very unique structures um, called LC3A SLS, or stone-like structures. And so um, if you look carefully, these dark arrows in the slide demarcate uh, these SLS structures, which are essentially very dense uh, structures staining positive for this marker. Um, and uh, it had been reported earlier that um, these, the presence of these structures in other cancers uh, correlated with uh, survival. And in fact, we, we found similar uh, um, associations in our cohort. Um, what, we, what I show here on the far right chart is an um, basically an association between the presence of uh, CA9 or an, uh, a hypoxic event and um, uh, the increased LC3A SLS score. Okay, so um, it appears that these two features, hypoxia and autophagy, uh, are associated in ovarian cancer. 
if you look at uh, a cohort of patients, and this is a, a cohort of greater than uh, 150 patients, and we simply ask the question whether the presence or absence of this marker or LC3 ASLS correlates with survival, we see that if patients have uh, or are positive for LC3 ASLS in this solid line, they have uh, poor survival compared to patients uh, which have no LC3 ASLS in, in the upper gray bar. And that's true for progression-free survival, disease-specific survival, and overall survival um, in this clear cell ovarian cancer cohort. And so that makes sense because one would expect that um, cells that were surviving through uh, this autophagy-induced pathway uh, those tumors would have an advantage and therefore cause patients to have a poor survival. Okay. Oops. Pardon me. Okay. So um, going back to this slide, um, I just wanted to re reiterate a couple of points, and, and that is that hypoxia um, is a, an important and uh, critical activator of the autophagy pathway and this angiogenic pathway. And what I think that really means is that the metabolic features of a tumor, as demonstrated by these markers of hypoxia, could play an important role in determining the immunological fate of uh, that particular tumor. And there, that's why I've put in, put another arrow here um, to entertain this idea that uh, hypoxia can also have a very important role on not only um, the immune response, but patient outcomes. So uh, many of you might be familiar with this literature already. This is a, a review article that was um, taken, uh, that, that was written a couple of years ago summarizing some of the very critical direct and indirect effects of hypoxia on normal immunity, on normal uh, adaptive and innate immune responses. Okay, So um, I won't go through all of these um, uh, sections in detail, but um, suffice to say that um, in the adaptive immune arm here, um, hypoxia uh, not only uh, impairs uh, T cell activation, but it actually can um, cause uh, changes in uh, naive T cell differentiation. Um, in particular, it drives the differentiation of TH17 phenotype and uh, also drives the uh, differentiation of FOXP3 positive uh, um, T regulatory cells, or pardon me, it, it causes the um, uh, increased degradation of the FOXP3 transcription factor resulting in um, the uh, reduction in these uh, T regulatory cells. And then there are also uh, numerous effects uh, on the innate adaptive immunity, which I um, won't get into today, but um, clearly play, um, these cells clearly play important roles in, in the anti-tumor response. And then as I mentioned earlier, um, hypoxia also has uh, very um, important roles on uh, the tum tumor endothelial cells mediating the neovascular genesis, um, possibly also uh, promoting metastasis of tumors and causing an overall shift in the metabolism of cancer cells to rely more heavily on um, glycolysis or, or the glycolytic pathway. Okay. Um, so the question really for, for, for me right now um, is how does uh, this tumor microenvironment influence T cell immunity? Um, as T cells uh, become activated, they see their antigens um, and they differentiate into effector cells. The, the problem now is that they need to traverse into 
uh, in the case of a tumor, they need to tra traverse into a very hostile tumor microenvironment, one that has a lot of these stressed response pathways induced by low oxygen, nutrient deprivation, et cetera. Um, and so uh, this is the point where you know, we really want to understand what this environment does to the T cells. And conversely, one can think of this more um, in a normal physiological response to, for example, infection or inflammation, which is also a very important um, uh, sort of area to understand how uh, those environments also impact um, T cell immunity. But I am going to focus primarily on this right side, which is the, the tumor microenvironment. So for the, the non-immunologists uh, um, in the field uh, and listening today, I just want to just make sure I bring people briefly up to speed. Um, we focus primarily on CD positive T effector cells, primarily because they're the cells that are involved in uh, providing anti-tumor immunity, but um, there are other arms of the immune system that are also important. Um, so the general response is that an antigen presenting cell um, takes up an antigen and presents it on its surface and displays it in the context of MHC molecules either to CD positive T cells or CD4 positive T cells. Uh, these T cells then uh, go on to become activated, okay, and they begin to express um, important uh, effector cytokines. And so a couple of the ones I've highlighted which are relevant for this talk are interferon gamma, uh, TI1, and granzyme B. And those cells that express these factors then go on to directly engage tumor cells and cause their uh, lysis and death. Okay. On the other side of uh, this paradigm is the uh, activation of CD4 positive helper T cells. Um, and much in the same way, once these cells become activated, they too release various cytokines that, as its name implies, help in mediating uh, the B cell differentiation in the plasma cells. And those plasma cells then go on to produce antibodies that um, neutralize tumor cells, although um, this is not necessarily a predominant uh, way that, that um, uh, CD4 positive T cells uh, can affect um, anti-tumor responses. Another important aspect is that CD4 positive T cells can differentiate into um, T regulatory cells, FOXP3 positive T regulatory cells. And these cells, by their nature and by their intrinsic name, uh, function to suppress the activities of both of these effector cells. So uh, we went back to our large cohort uh, of uh, tissues from our ovarian cancer patients um, and began to ask um, uh, what uh, markers could we use to help us uh, determine the, the metabolic environment. So using CD31, uh, we found something very interesting, uh, which at the time was somewhat unexpected. And what we found is that CD31 high um, expressing um, tissues from patients uh, had much better outcomes here than patients that had uh, CD31 low expressing uh, uh, tumors. Okay. The reason this was counterintuitive is that one would expect that if tumors were CD31 high or positive, that would imply that there was uh, an adequate uh, vascular, vasculature network. Okay? And please remember that, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, this marker, um, the caveat with using it is that it doesn't tell you about uh, the functionality of those vessels, um, but they tell you about the presence of them. So, um, you know, that's one uh, important consideration in this analysis. But 
if they were functional and if they were present, one would expect the tumors themselves would have an advantage. They would be able to have an unlimited access to all the nutrients that are brought to the, the tumor environment by the vasculature, and therefore they would probably have a growth advantage. And, 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 and that would result in actually um, poorer outcomes or poor survival. But in fact, we found the opposite. Okay, and so we'll, I'll get into that um, uh, in a little bit more with some of the data I'll show you. And um, this analysis just really shows you that there was a very strong correlation between uh, CD31 hive um, and uh, VEGF uh, uh, hive um, tumors. Okay, so. We also then uh, did an analysis to look at um, whether there was a correlation between uh, this, what I call vascular density score, or CD31 vascular density, and the presence or absence of uh, different tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Uh, so this analysis where we looked at here in panel A, uh, we found that um, there was a correlation between a higher vascular density score and the presence of uh, CD positive T cells, CD4 positive T cells in panel B, and Fox B3 positive um, cells in panel C. Okay. There was also a very co strong correlation uh, between the functional markers of those effector cells. So there was a strong correlation with uh, the CD31 vascular density and the presence of TI1 positive cells, as well as granzyme B positive cells. So not only the presence, but also the functional aspects of those effector cytokines were correlated with uh, higher density scores. Okay. Okay, so we then took a step back and we um, wanted to look in vitro more carefully at the effects of hypoxia on these effector cells. So um, using murine uh, T cells, uh, what we did was we activated those T cells in culture, uh, either in the presence here of 21% oxygen or um, 1%, 1.5% oxygen, which is a, a typical uh, oxygen tension used um, to simulate hypoxia in vitro right here. Uh, and so what we can find is that T cells under hypoxia here uh, secrete much less interferon gamma, uh, as well as TNF-alpha, which is not shown in this data slide. Um, but then we took those cells that had been um, cultured under these conditions and co-cultured them with a target cell, a target cell that, that these cells are able to recognize and actually cause lysis. And as depicted in this panel on uh, the right-hand side, uh, cells that were subjected to hypoxia uh, had a uh, severe impairment in their ability to actually target and kill their, effector, uh, their target cells compared to cells under, under normoxia, this upper uh, line here. Okay, so what does this mean for patient outcomes though? So we went back and we looked at the same data set and we compared um, the or we looked at um, the uh, association between uh, the, the vasculature, either using CD31 in panel A or VEGF in panel D. And we asked whether or not uh, the presence of uh, these different uh, T cell subsets or functional markers of those T cell subsets had any relationship to overall patient outcomes. And what we found is that uh, 
regardless of the presence or absence of those subsets or their markers, so here and here, patient survival was always better when they correlated with uh, um, high vasculature, essentially. So uh, CE34 high or VEGF high here in the dark and the solid lines. <clears throat> Okay, um, so um, what I want to point out is that these earlier studies that we conducted were um, performed on essentially single serial sections of tissues from these patients. And so uh, while the markers can be correlated with each other statistically, and we can infer that these different phenomenon are occurring together. Um, definitive proof for that um, requires, uh, you know, more detailed colocalization studies. Okay. Um, so we started to um, attack this problem by the following way. So what you see here are three um, uh, images stained with three different uh, markers. So CA9, uh, CD8, and CD34. And uh, they're in different colors uh, demarcated uh, over here. This is the same tissue section stained with three different markers. And so when you merge these sections together, uh, you can now begin to ask very um, specific questions on the localization pattern. Okay, so here's a merged image of all three of those. And uh, for simplicity, I didn't color code this, pseudo color coded it, but rather left it as the uh, original immunohistochemistry stain. Um, so what we can take from this is that, A, uh, there are regions of hypoxia um, here, pink, donated in pink, these areas here. Okay, I'll just um, donate it in pink. Okay, here, so here are the hypoxia regions. This is CA9, okay. And um, other regions that are denoted by the vasculature, so these bluish vessel, uh, positive staining vessels, okay. And then in brown, um, the presence of T cells. So you can see um, a smattering of T cells. Um, but what we initially found from this analysis is that if you actually drew some lines of separation between areas of positivity for vasculature, here's one here, there were of much more T cells that were present in those areas compared to other areas that were hypoxic or, or positive for hypoxic markers here, okay? So um, this really began to uh, inform us that infiltration of uh, in this particular example of CD positive T cells may be actually restricted by whether or not there was adequate um, vascularization of, in that particular region of the tumor. Here's another example of that. Okay, so um, again, sort of this bluish area where you have positive uh, vessels, you see these nice brown spots containing T cells, where all of these other pink areas that you see outside, on the outside, these pink areas, really they're devoid of, of T cells. So this is one example on the left and another example on the right. Okay. Okay, so this is, again, just a little close-up image. Um, we've changed the coloring a bit here. These are the hypoxic regions, the brown ones, which are C9 positive. 
the T cells are in blue, bluish, greenish color here. Uh, let me just denote that so you can see them. These are the T cells, right? And then these are the blue areas that are positive for the vasculature. And again, you see that in the vast majority of cases, there are very few T cells present in the, in the hypoxic or CNI positive regions. So we've now begun to enumerate um, with some painstaking uh, uh, scoring, but um, this chart is, a, is now an interim analysis of that. And basically what we can find is that um, in red, this is, so each bar represents a different uh, tumor section. In red, uh, we've separated uh, the tumors into areas that are hypoxic in red or non-hypoxic in blue using those two markers. And we've asked the question whether T cells are, are found in the red zones, i.e. hypoxic zones, or in the blue zones, the non-hypoxic zones. And essentially, you can see there's a lot more red and therefore a lot more T cells. These numbers up here donate the number of T cells found in those red zones um, that are present in uh, 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 the non-hypoxic regions. Sorry, I think I might have misspoke. The red is the non-hypoxic region, and the blue is the hypoxic region. <clears throat> OK, so um, in summary, um, I think what uh, I'd like to uh, leave you with today is that um, we feel that the, what we've been able to show is that the hypoxic environment, the, the microenvironment of the, of the tumor, has a very important role in dictating um, the immune, the presence and the function of the immune system. And in turn, um, that could have really important consequences on the outcomes of patients. Okay? And um, probably what we think is happening is that this part of the immune suppression is related to the metabolic environment. And as I said earlier on uh, in the talk, I think that uh, it's going to be very important as we uh, move into this era of cancer immunotherapies, vaccines, uh, uh, T cell based therapies, those sorts of things, um, that we truly understand uh, what the T cells are going to be faced with. What, what are they up against when they actually reach and are exposed to the environment of this tumor? And really, um, how can we arm these effector cells appropriately um, to overcome uh, that immune suppression? Um, so that's really the, the gist of uh, not only um, the, the research interest in my lab, but also this particular talk um, so I'm going to stop here, and uh, I welcome you to uh, ask some questions. I'm just clicking over on the Q&A tab right now, and I, I don't have any listed, but um, I'm happy to, to entertain questions uh, from the audience. Thank you very much for your time. I, I hope uh, the talk was informative to you. I'll just give a, a couple of minutes in case people are, are typing some things um, and uh, might be a little bit of lag time for them to show up on the screen. Um. Okay, it looks like there's a question here. 
So the question uh, from the audience is, could you uh, explain the better outcome when high numbers of FOXP3 positive cells are present along with CD31 high expression? Okay, so um, that's a very good question. And I'll, let me turn back so that um, we're all on the same page. So um, here it is here. So this figure uh, on uh, the left-hand side, uh, A, shows that um, the presence of FOXP3 cells in the high vascular region correlates with better outcome. And why is that possible if the conventional and prevailing thought is that FOXP3 cells are suppressor cells? Um, so um, we don't have the uh, specific answer to that. Um, but what I can say is that my colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Nelson and others, um, are now um, really trying to dissect what FOXP3 cells actually um, mark. Um, there are at least five different um, uh, manuscripts or publications showing that the presence of FOXP3 cells are prognostic and that patients who express high levels actually do better. Again, why is that? Well, it turns out, at, uh, at least uh, some of the early data, um, not by my laboratory, suggests that FOXP3 cells are very heterogeneous. Okay. So um, there are subsets that are actually CD8 positive and express effector cytokines, such as interferon gamma, um, whereas there are also subsets that truly look like conventional C4 positive, FOXP3 positive, C25 positive suppressor cells. So, um, so while I can't fully explain uh, why this is the case, um, there may be a role for other FOXP3 cells that are not of the regulatory nature that could be uh, important in uh, you know, the results that are shown here. Okay, so I hope, I hope that answers your question. There's a second question here. Um, does it appear that tumor cells could be influencing angiogenesis levels that would best support their existence? Um, so um, let me try to answer the question if, if I understand it correctly. Um, Yes, absolutely. I think that the tumor cells, um, as they become exposed to uh, these different uh, metabolic stresses, whether that be a hypoxia limitation or, or a hypoxia or you know other nutrients that are limited in the environment, um, they begin to act, actually secrete um, factors like VEGF that recruit uh, angiogenic uh, vessels from the endothelium. Um, so these cells, the endothelial cells express the receptor um, that then signal to induce new angiogenesis. And the idea then is that the tumor cells um, are providing signals that act that, that act to uh, continue to support, uh, you know, their metabolic needs, the high metabolic demands that are required for their um, existence, if you will, as you suggested. Um, so I hope that also answers your question. Um, okay. Any, uh, any other follow-up questions or new ones that I could help uh, clarify? Okay, um, if there isn't anything more, um, 
even if you're in the middle of a question, you can send it and I can, oh yeah, there is another question coming. So um, I'll just read the comment in the question. We know that FOXP3 transcription factor occupies the promoter, promoters for genes involved in regulatory T cell function. Uh, would you please explain this aspect more? Yeah, um, this is a good question as well. And um, I, I actually um, can't address it probably to the fullest extent that you're looking for because um, I, I, don't, um, I don't know that much about the, the, the transcription factors that are occupied by the FOXP3, uh, the, the, the sites, basically. Um, so, you know, I'm just thinking that one could imagine that um, if FOXP3 uh, is uh, present and it is occupying these other promoters that um, potentially uh, what could happen is it could lead to uh, a feedback um, if those genes are involved in signals that, um, for example, um, cause FOXP3 cells to exert their um, suppressive functions. One might imagine that there's a feedback that would um, uh, cause those cells to um, become uh, ingrained. I'm not sure if that's the right word I'm, I want to use. Um, um, to, to maintain their stability, I guess. Right? Um, but clearly, I think what we're now understanding as we dissect these subsets of FOXP3 cells is that we don't know, A, um, whether or not they're, they're, they belong to one specific subset, and if so, are those subsets the predominant ones that are exerting their functions on the effector cells? Um, we don't know if they're antigen specific, meaning um, I think there's some literature now that suggests that FOXP3 cells can be antigen specific, but whether they're antigen specific in their suppressor role or whether they mediate antigen specific responses uh, in a different way by a, an effector phenotype, um, that too is really unknown. Uh, but these are really good questions um, and, you know, it's going to be really important. Um, because you know these T cell therapies that we're uh, um, you know beginning to explore clinically um, will comprise and have uh, a mixture of different cell types. Um, not only how do those subtype cell, cell subtypes affect one another, um, but as I tried to allude to in this talk, uh, how do once those cells get to the the microenvironment of the tumor. How, do, how, how are they going to be influenced? Maybe when these FOXP3 cells get to the tumor, because of these metabolic uh, changes, um, uh, they begin to express a whole different battery of uh, genes and uh, functions, uh, something that we simply haven't um, explored yet, but uh, worth doing. Okay, um, I'll just give one last moment for any uh, remaining questions. Uh, we, do, we do have a little bit more time, so um, I'm happy to entertain them. Um, Okay, great. Well, I want to thank everyone again for joining in this particular webcast for my presentation. Um, uh, if you didn't have a chance to ask some questions now, I'm uh, happy to uh, entertain them um, by email if you want. Um, and so uh, 
thank you all again for coming and hope you uh, enjoyed the webcast. Goodbye.